Many people have asked us, what are great games you can bring to work or school to play on a lunch break? Today we look at one of those, Scora, from Inside the Box Games, who we have to thank for sending us a review copy of this filler game. All right, Scora was designed by Rory Muldoon and Rose Atkinson. It features some really striking art by Rory Muldoon himself. Published in 2020 by Inside the Box Games LLP, which is a limited partnership under their lunchbox games line now the card game score is a game of fishing and feuding but it's mostly about fishing it's a small card count lightning quick area majority game played over two rounds the first round players are playing catch cards onto the board which are divided into three fishing spots while placing some cards they're also going to add boats to the different regions once all cards are played car players will draft cards in order based on area majority using the boats in addition each card's worth points the players also have a hidden scoring card they chose at the start of the game that they can use to earn bonus points if you want to see what you can get in the lunchbox sized box for scora check out our somewhat glitchy scora unboxing video on youtube yeah. I do apologize for the quality on this one, especially the part where the video breaks up when Mo is talking about the rule book. While we consider just not publishing, the rest of the video is good, and it really shows off the cards well. Yeah, I do apologize for that one. We don't know what happened with the original video. We had to download it from Twitch, and it didn't turn out as well as we'd hoped. I think Sean did as best he could trying to recover what he could. And I think we'll still figure it's better than nothing. At least you do get to see what is in the box for the most part. Now, the first thing I do want to know about score is that box. Um, as Sean said, it's like it's lunchbox size. Like it really is. It's meant to look like a small lunchbox. It's the right size. and even has artwork on the top for as a handle, which I didn't get at first. I was like, what's this supposed to be? And I'm like, oh, it's a lunchbox. I get it. Plus, it's very solid. Like it's just a, a nice solid box that flips open from the front, which is held shut by a magnet. Now, inside the box, you'll find a short, easy to read and learn seven page rule book. Actually, only six pages are rules. This is the kind of game where you could sit down, open it up with players at the table and sit and learn the game together. This doesn't require a lot of prep ahead of time. Under that are some punch boards that hold the ocean board. This is a board divided into three um, segments and some axe tokens. These are nice and thick, like really significantly thick cardboard. There are six wooden boat tokens in four different player colors. These do also feature unique flag artwork, which I like because this will help out anyone who has any difficulty telling the colors apart. The, it does look like the colors are already colorblind friendly, but just in case, there's also the distinguishing feature of the flags to tell them apart. There are two sets of cards included with Scora, catch cards and decree cards. Uh, the decree cards are end game scoring cards. The catch cards feature three different suits. There's fish, claws, and sharks. And there are two different numbered cards for each suit. The numbers range from one to six, and there are four copies of each card included in the game. And that's it. Individual suits are distinguished by both color and iconography. Again, a thumbs up for accessibility there. Each card also features some pretty striking Viking-themed artwork and some additional game text. So how about you give us an overview of this fishing-themed game? All right, so you start a game by placing the ocean board in the center of the table between all the players. This has three areas divided into thirds, A, B, and C, and a spot for a row of cards to come off each area. Players start assembling their hand by collecting one of each of the catch cards numbered one, two, and three. That'll give them all three suits as well. Remaining cards numbered four to six are shuffled. One card gets placed face up in each section of the ocean, and then the rest are dealt out evenly to each player with any remaining cards removed from the game. Next, players get two randomly assigned decree cards. They pick one to keep and discard the other. These are endgame scoring cards that are going to give bonus points for things like having the majority of one of the three card types, having only caught two of the three types of catch cards, or having different creatures in your final catch, and so on. So the Viking theme I'm feeling right now is pretty sketchy at best. Yeah, the Viking, the only thing Viking about this game is the artwork, really. So, yes, so this is kind of why um, it's, it's a unique take on Viking thing. Like, normally when you think Vikings, you're, you're thinking raiding, right, or pillaging, or, or capturing monasteries, or invading England, not catching sharks, crabs, and fish. It's, it's definitely a, a unique take on the Viking theme. 
So once you get to the actual gameplay, it is broken into two distinct phases. First is the baiting phase, and then there's the fishing phase. During the baiting phase, each player will play one card to one of the three ocean areas. The card is played on top of any previously played cards in that area, making a row slowly going out from the ocean board. So you can always see the previous card. Each card features a catch type, uh, showing the suit of either fish, claws, or sharks, a point value from one to six, a creature type with an image, and an action. As each card's played, you're going to carry out its action. Now, cards one through three have players add boats to the ocean location the card's played at. So if you play in the one, A row, you put boats in the A ocean. The four and five cards manipulate the cards already in the playing field, uh, moving one card from the location they're played at to an adjacent spot, so from A to B or C. While the six card actually doesn't do anything when you play it, it is worth six points. Cut bait or get out. So if the card played matches the suit of the card it's placed on top of, so you put a shark on a shark or a fish on a fish, you also get to collect an axe token. This is your supposed battling, I guess. After placing a card, you also get the option to move one of your already played boats from one ocean spot to another. Once everyone has played all their cards going around the table, the baiting phase ends and you move to the fishing phase. So during the fishing phase, are going to collect those catch cards that were played earlier. Shouldn't you catch collect cards? Collecting catch cards just seems wrong. Uh, they call <laughs> them catch cards. I'm surprised they're not called, I guess they can't call them fish cards because there's also sharks and crabs. I don't know. Catch cards is an interesting choice for it, but I think it's the overall all your cards are your catch. I don't, I don't know. The theming again here is a little rough. So you start with the A Ocean area. Player with the most boats selects one catch card collects it and keeps it till the end of the game and then they remove one of their boats then the second player the person who had the second most boats selects one card to take then the person with the third and the fourth most boats in the area this continues until all players have collected a card for each boat and then if a player runs out of boats they just can't collect any more cards and if the cards run out any leftover boats there are wasted by the players note that the order of card selection is set right at the beginning so it's not like it changes every time someone removes a boat. It doesn't alter. So once you've determined the order of control, the boats just show how many cards you're going to get to take. Now, if there is a tie for area majority, this is where the axes come in. The player with the most axe tokens wins the tie, but then they have to lose one of their axe tokens, which could affect a future tie because you could be tied at the A spot and then tied again at the B spot. If players are still tied for the number of axe tokens, the tie goes to the player earliest in turn order. Play continues like this, resolving each of the three ocean areas until everyone's collected all the cards they can. Now, special note with two players, when selecting a card to collect, you also pick a second card at that location to remove from the game. You continue the fishing round, drafting cards from each of the three oceans until all cards are gone or are claimed. And then once everyone's completed fishing, all you do is add up your catch cards. You just add up the number on the top right corners. Cards are worth victory points based on those numbers, and you're also going to score points if you manage to complete your decree card. Whoever has most points wins. Now, for the record, since we're talking, we have mentioned the Viking theme. Scora in Old Norse means to mark, cut, or score, and has nothing at all to do with fishing, but counting up totals by scoring numbers, basically. Yeah, so the game is basically called Victory Points, uh, I guess, <laughs> <laughs> in Norse. <laughs> Um, so the thing with Scora, to, to get and understand this game, you have to realize what it is. So I think you need to know what the goal of Inside the Box games is trying to do with these lunchbox games. So the goal here is to have a number of small box games that you can literally bring to lunch, right? That's the point of the lunchbox games. They're quick to teach, easy to learn. They rely on tried, true, and tested game mechanics that most people are familiar with, making them very accessible to gamers and non-gamers alike. They take up small footprints, they don't require a lot of space, and they don't need like a dedicated gaming area to play. They play quickly to all playing in less than half an hour. When looked at in that light, Scora succeeds admirably. Now, while there are two other Lunchbox games lined up, neither are released yet. That's correct. This is the first one. And I got to say, if the others are any indication, I'm looking forward to seeing the other ones. Because besides being a great quick filler game, it looks fantastic. I love the aesthetic that Rory Muldoon went with. Like there's where I think the, like the Viking theme never shines through. 
but I appreciate it for how good looking the card art is. And I like the layout of the cards. Now I will admit there is one thing I would like to improve and that would be to put the card point value on this under the suit on the left hand side, just because I'm a longtime card player. I want to fan my hand. And when fanning your hand, you can't see all the information you'd want. But you know what? Your largest hand size is playing two player with seven cards and a four player game. You're only playing with five. So it's not, it's not a big, it's not a problem. It just would have been nice. Now the quality of the components here is top notch. I've already noted how much I like the box. I was also impressed by the card quality. I don't know what they did for the finish on these, but it's way more matte than almost every other card I've seen, which makes them really easy to read both in hand and across the table, even with overhead lights, which is something I suffer with. This is really nice. Now the cardboard is super thick. Boat meeples are well-designed. They look neat. Um, I, again, I really appreciate the fit they put graphics on them accessibility though my wife did think the purple one looks a bit like a t-shirt and while the kids thought they were top hats the first time they played i gotta say they do kind of all really if you turn them upside down and hand them to someone out of context i think a t-shirt is the first thing that someone's going to think of if they see that meeple yeah i get it i see it you put them up the right side i guess you see especially you put them on the ocean with the waves you get it still they're nice pieces it, it could have been cubes I, I appreciate the fact it's not just cubes so added to the game looking cool and being great for lunchtime, gameplay is also really solid. Now, what this reminds me of is the plethora of small card count filler games that came out probably in the last five years. I didn't actually look up. It might be 10 years now. I might be getting old here. But it became popular with Love Letter. Love Letter is so famous for being a card game that only has 13 cards in it. And a whole bunch of Love Letter isotopes came out after that. Well, Scora is similar to those. This game only features 24 cards and you only use all 24 at the highest player count. You actually use even less if you're playing with less than four players. And this is a game all about counting cards and perfect to near perfect information. You always know what's out there, except if you're playing with four players or two players, there's always one card that's removed from the game. So other than that, you know every card in the game's out there except for that one card. So it's all about figuring out what cards your opponents have and trying to predict what they'll do with them. So not world changing, but solid, which yeah. for a lunchtime game. Exactly. So where Scora went from good and solid to, yeah, it's okay, is two players. While the game works two players, it's using variant rules. And anyone who's a long time listener of the show knows how we feel about variant rules for player counts. Uh, these rules mean that you're going to draft two cards instead of one every time. And what this meant is that in most games, players waste boats almost everywhere and only earn a small handful of scoring cards like four was about the max with your three was the average and to be honest it's an area majority game and we've said it before no area majority game really works well with two players because it's you have it or i have it and that's it and even with the tiebreaker it just gives an, an advantage to the first player uh, unfortunately perhaps for people who don't eat lunch with more than one person yeah, especially with today's current state of the world, uh, lunchbox games may not be the best things to put out into the market. But I, overall, though, uh, this is a fast playing filler with some really solid mechanics. Uh, limiting the number of the cards in the game means you have a really good idea of what's out there at all times, making the decisions in the game very tactical. Now, I personally prefer my area majority games to be on the longer and heavier side, I did find Scora had, did a good job of scratching that area majority itch. It comes in as a nice solid two weight. Yeah, that's significant for a half hour game or less. Now where Scora shines is at doing exactly what it was designed to do. It's an accessible, quick to play game that still manages to have some meat on it. A game perfect for breaking out during a lunch break or as a starter or filler on game night. If you're looking for a game to fill that niche, Scora is a great choice. Now, if you are into heavier area majority games that you like are more complicated and longer, this probably isn't going to have enough depth to keep you interested, but it may be worth checking out because sometimes having something to fill the half hour gap of free time is just what you need. Well, be sure to check out our written review of Scora by heading over to tabletopbellhop.com and clicking on reviews.